recording. Great. So uh, welcome to Talking Data Equity for December 8th, 2023. My name is Heather Kraus, and I am the founder of an organization called We All Count. And the purpose of We All Count is to um, build tools that help you uh, embed equity in all of your data projects. And uh, I'm very, very excited to welcome you to something that the We All Count team does most Fridays, which is called Talking Data Equity. And the purpose of Talking Data Equity is to create a space where anybody from any sector, any part of the world, who is interested in figuring out ways to get equity into their data projects or their work um, can come talk about what's working, talk about what isn't working, share resources, share stories, and bottom line, feel a little bit less alone. So that's the point of talking data equity. And we do have it most Fridays. So we will have uh, it today. Obviously, you're here. We will have it next Friday. And um, then we'll take a short break uh, while I um, rest for a little while. And then we'll be back in uh, early January. And one of the things about talking data equity is that we try and keep the Zoom link the same. We try and keep the tech as easy and straightforward as possible so that the Zoom link is the same for every Friday. And um, some of you have very, very generously um, wanted to uh, share <laughs> the news about attending talking data equity with your colleagues who you think would find it valuable. And we really, really appreciate that. And at the same time, we um, ask that you do not share the Zoom link for talking data equity um, on social media, any kind of social media. Uh, a couple of really well-intentioned people uh, were amplifying talking data equity this week and sharing the Zoom link. Uh, so please don't do that because that is the way that we will get bots and Zoom bombers and stuff like that. So um, we do have a link always on our website, which allows anybody who's interested to sign up and get the link emailed to them uh, so that they can have it and they'll get some calendar invites and stuff like that. And I do not want to make it sound like we're not grateful that you are amplifying uh, Talking Data Equity. We are very grateful. Um, we just really don't want Zoom bots and Zoom bombers. So please do not share the link um, in in any form of a public setting, okay? Um, thank you. Having said that, uh, I am extremely excited uh, for our special guest today. Uh, I met uh, our special guest, uh, Daniel, at uh, a workshop and uh, he immediately started talking about some very interesting insights into um, the way that equity applies to his work. And I said, please come, <laughs> please come meet the Talking Data Equity uh, community. And he very, very generously did. And um, so I'm really, really excited to be able to introduce you um, to, uh, sorry, I think there's a great. Um, really excited to introduce you to um, Daniel Segesenman, and he is a postdoctoral research fellow in atmospheric, oceanic, and earth sciences at George Mason, which is in Virginia, and he's studying geology, paleontology at Western, at West Virginia University for his bachelor's and his master's degree. And he just recently finished up his PhD. So congratulations. That's a big deal in geosciences at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And what Daniel does <laughs> in all this very fancy sounding work is uh, he uses data sets on rocks and fossils at the continental scale to investigate how Earth's surface and how life on Earth have influenced each other over millions and millions of years. Most recently, Daniel has worked on research to better understand geologic processes that influence the evolution of the oldest known animals in fossil record, which is like 
we're talking like 575 to 485 million years ago. Um, so you can see why this immediately caught my attention because I really want to think about data equity and fossils. Um, when not lost in the murky depths of Earth's history, Daniel enjoys reading science fiction, fantasy, watching movies, and getting out on hikes to enjoy uh, the natural world. So uh, enough from me. I am going to very excitedly uh, turn things over to Daniel. And while Daniel is sharing his story and his slides, feel free to use the Zoom chat as much as you want to ask questions and uh, make comments. But we do want you to stay on mute while Daniel is sharing. And then at the end, we'll have a, an open question and answer period where anybody can turn their microphones on and ask questions. Thanks, Daniel. Well, thank you for that introduction. I'll go ahead and restart sharing my slides. Make sure we're all good to roll there. Again, swap the presenter view slideshow. Okay, I think we should be good. We can just see slides. We're not seeing presenter view. All right, excellent. All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me here, Heather. I am excited. I am always excited to talk about Earth history. I love everything about paleontology, Earth history, geology, and learning about our Earth in deep time. And when Heather gave the workshop that I was at for data equity, I'd never, it, it put into context things that I've thought about, but never really had terminology to discuss or, but it was really interesting to think about data equity from the lens of a data set where, well, there humans are involved in it and we obviously we study it, but you know, there's not direct human data being examined in this information. So I, you know, I jumped at the chance when invited to come and talk to you all. And I like to give a presentation that's a little bit different from what I normally do, where it's more of a story uh, and telling the story of, um, how I got started and interested in paleontology and geology and leading up to starting from there and going all the way up to the point where I just had a paper get published four days ago, uh, just popped up online. And so we're going to go from the motivations, the founding, all the way to how do we get to this publication here at the end. All right. And so first off, when talking about data equity, uh, you know, I see Earth's history as belonging to everyone. The history of Earth's ever-changing surface and of life's evolution on Earth, these are our stories. Everyone shares this history. This is our home, and this is the story of how our home came to be the way that it is. And so, you know, everything that I, I think about with Earth history, this is the connection I make from studying things that are 500 or 600 million years old and to our lives today, right? Yes, we can study it for the sake of studying history, but this is how we're all connected. This is a history we all share as far as we understand it in geologic time. And so you might be confused why I'm starting off with a picture of Rockville Garden, but this is where my story for geology and paleontology started, where it was, uh, I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania in a small town called Littlestown near Gettysburg. And I had grandparents who lived in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we'd go up there and visit them, you know, frequently on the weekends. And, you know, especially for Morgantown game days. So go Mountaineers, uh, you know, and uh, as part of it, I would go out into my grandparents' backyard. They had a big backyard and they had a neighbor who had a rock fill around a tree. And when I was, I would start digging around that rock fill. So I was elementary school, seven, eight, nine. And, you know, I don't really know if I knew what a fossil was before I found things or if I discovered what a fossil was by finding these. But in the rock fill, I found these imprints of seashells. And clearly I recognized them as seashells it's hard not to recognize them. i was like how do we have seashells in this rockville in the middle of west virginia a mountainous <laughs> state that is not there's no water anywhere near it so i was fascinated with it and so i wanted to learn more and in the 90s you know as i was growing up the 90s and early 2000s most of what was available for thinking about earth history and early earth is dinosaur focused right so i went nuts on learning about dinosaurs. I read the Walking with Dinosaurs book. I watched all the Walking with Dinosaurs videos. When I was old enough, my parents let me watch Jurassic Park, quickly became my favorite movie. Uh, I've watched a lot of Land Before Time, Disney's Dinosaur, you name it, right? It was all very, very dinosaur folks. In fact, my nickname, I had a nickname in school, in middle and high school, Dan Dan the Dino Man, because I always had my head buried in a book about dinosaurs and fossils. 
And so eventually, you know, I finished up high school and I went to West Virginia University for college uh, for my undergraduate. And I actually started as pre-psychology. So I had convinced myself that, well, geology and paleontology, is that really a real job, right? And it it was all very dinosaur focused. And so there's maybe a handful of well-known public figures studying dinosaurs. I'm like, well, maybe I need to focus on something else as a career. But in my first year uh, of pre-psychology, you also have to have general education. I saw, hey, there's geology. I've never really had an earth science class before. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And I took it and I realized, hey, wait, I don't have to just study dinosaurs. I love rocks and earth's history and fossils, and I can study all of these things. And it doesn't have to be focused on dinosaurs. There's actually a ton of stuff we can learn about, uh, you know, fossils and paleontology. And so I finished my undergraduate, I switched my major to geology, finished my undergraduate and got a bachelor's in geology. And then I stuck around because they had a paleontologist on staff who became my advisor, Dr. Thomas Kammer. And with him, I worked on these things called crinoids that you see on your screen. And crinoids are sea lilies, uh, or known as sea lilies today. They have living members today, but they also have a fossil record that goes back almost all the way to the Cambrian and more than likely the Ordovician, so 450 to 500 million years old. So these critters have been around for a long time. And what I did with them is I actually looked at their diversity through time in response to a major climatic event in deep time called the late Paleozoic Ice Age. And there's all these graphs on here and whatnot. But really the interesting story here was is that I found that uh, previously uh, other studies had just looked at all the crinoids together. But if we split the crinoids into distinct groups that they are recognized as, one group actually did really well during the late Paleozoic Ice Age, and all the rest of the groups of crinoids did not do so well. And it turns out at the same time as there's this big glaciation, all the continents were smashing together. They threw a bunch of sand out into the ocean. And a lot of these crinoids grew on carbonate ramps that were pristine, and they didn't have any way to move themselves uh, because they have these filter feeding fans. And these advanced cladids had muscular arm articulations that allowed them to flick their fans. or would have allowed them to flick their fans and clear themselves of sediment on them, right? But we can get into all that. That is a whole other thing. But as I was studying my master's, I, you know, absorbed anything, geology, paleontology, earth history. So I was studying crinoids, but I wanted to know more about what is the origin of all animals? You know, a, you know, crinoids are just one group related to sea stars, sea urchins, other thing, other echinoderms, uh, sea cucumbers as well. Uh, but I was curious about early sea animals. So as I was studying geology and paleontology and learning more about earth history, I settled on this time period known as the Ediacaran. And it's the newest edition of the geologic time scale. Uh, and it was added in 2006. And actually that's the first edition to the geologic time scale of a formal period in over a hundred years. All the rest had been set before that. But anyway, the reason that this period is very interesting is because it is known as the dawn of animals. And what we're looking at here are fossils of some of the oldest known animals from the fossil record on earth. And so we see these shapes and things that look maybe kind of like things you've seen before, but it was a pretty different world, pretty strange. And then following the Ediacaran is this period known as the Cambrian. And maybe you've heard of the Cambrian explosion of life. And we have, again, all these really weird critters, but in the Cambrian, all of the organisms or all of the representatives of modern animals show up in the Cambrian at the order, the taxonomic order of phyla, if you're interested in that. And so all modern phyla have their roots that show up in the Cambrian. But previous to that in the Ediacaran, there are things that we can't even match to modern phyla because they're just so different from anything that is alive today. But there are things we clearly recognize as animals. They show up in the Ediacaran. And so at this stage, I had developed and realized my personal motivation for studying Earth history and fossil organisms, which I reached the edge of what we think we know, and I wanted to know more. I wasn't satisfied with everything we had. I wanted to know more. And so another major factor in my time at West Virginia in my master's is I met the person I would marry. 
This is Brittany Hupp, Dr. Brittany Nicole Hupp, who studies paleoclimate using microfossils such as foraminifera. That is actually an SEM photo in the upper left of a 4M up close with little diagenetic crystals growing off of it that she took for part of her research. And on the right is actually 4Ms that she has been a part of culturing in the modern. So again, these are species that have fossil records and modern records, and she uses these to reconstruct past climates so we can better predict future climates. And this is part of the data that informs things such as what we see at COP28 is predictions of future climate. So it's a small part, but it is very much a part. And so we both love fossils, paleontology, and I met her. And so we started applying for PhDs, uh, you know, because we both wanted to continue on our academic careers. And the only place we both got in was at University of Wisconsin-Madison. So we applied to quite a few places, but we were all trying to apply to the same places. And we got at University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is where I met my advisor, Dr. Shannon Peters. And this is where I learned about Macrostrat. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about Macrostrat in detail because this is a a uh, very integral part of my PhD and the research that I have recently got published. And so Macrostrat is a data platform for rocks and their locations. And if you go to Macrostrat, there's interactive visualizations. And you can go to macrostrat.org and click on the map button or just go to this URL, macrostrat.org slash map. And it'll take you to this lovely 3D globe. And it has all these different colors across the continental surfaces. Well, it turns out these colors correspond to the geologic time scale. So you're, what you're looking at is the age distribution of rocks across Earth's surface. For instance, you see, maybe you see in the Middle East, into Russia and Asia, that there's a lot of yellow. Well, that corresponds to the neogene. So there's a lot of more recent sedimentary cover that has covered up rocks that are older. Whereas in Africa, maybe you see that there's all this pink, which corresponds to the Precambrian, which refers to all of Earth history before 540 million years. And you can see that there's a lot of really exposed old rock there in Africa. And if we go to North America, so it's not just a global scale geologic map, but the scale of the map changes as you zoom in. So when there's more highly resolved information available, as you zoom in, Macrostrat re you know, renders and shows you the different map resolutions as you zoom in further and further. So as, as a, my normal party trick for a presentation like this, I like to pick a location and then zoom in on it. For instance, this time I've picked Toronto because as far as I could understand, this was a headquarters for We All Count. And so if you zoom in on Toronto and you pick a location, so if you click on the map, you know, within one of these colors, it will tell you all the information about those rocks that are there. So Toronto is sitting on Ordovician, so 450 million year old rocks that used to be an ocean floor. And these there's fossil collections here. And I can tell you that those are really cool, crazy uh, ocean dwelling uh, nautiloids and squids and other things, uh, you know, crinoids as well will be found there. Uh, and so, you know, you can look at what are the rocks beneath your feet. And so this is one of the really interesting things about Macrostrat, but there's an app for that. Uh, and it's called Rocked. So if you wanted to look at this information from Macrostrat as you're going along, if you're just anywhere in the world, uh, you can use Rock to get an idea of what are the rocks beneath your feet. And you can also use Rock to look, if you're really interested in rocks, you like to go out, look at outcrops or fossils. Well, you can actually use this to identify where people have reported that there are rock outcrops and fossils. And actually, this has been an excellent tool for teaching in geology, because then you can crowdsource where there are places that you can take students for field trips, et cetera, right? Or if you're just interested for your own personal use, you want to know more about the rocks beneath your feet, right? So there's a lot of applications of Macrostrat, right, that, are, that go beyond research. But now I'm going to focus more on some of the research out aspects. So one of the powerful things you can do with Macrostrat is you can now filter the rock record. You can take all of it and then you can say, no, 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 I just want this slice of it, right? So now this is if you go to the map and you filter by the Cretaceous period. This is the last period that dinosaurs were alive on earth. Sorry, non-avian dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. They're alive today. So dinosaurs survived, right? But the non-avian dinosaurs were still wandering around on Earth in the Cretaceous, and we can now see in North America, this is the distribution of all 
only Cretaceous age rock. So there's quite a lot of it, right? Because it is fairly recent, right? So there hasn't been as much of it that has been eroded over time. We can also get more specific. We can have multiple filters. So we can say filter by the Paleogene and coal. And now we're looking at the distribution of swamps after the dinosaurs died out, the not even dinosaurs. And we can actually filter it by things like coal and the swamps that then deposit that coal that gets mined out and used in, or traditionally has been used in energy applications for quite some time. Hopefully we'll be transitioning away. Okay, and the other things we can learn are, we can start to look and see patterns in the whole thing, right? So we can look at all of the rocks and we can see patterns. Now, what you're looking on the left is an XKCD graph of different you know, estimates of the glacial height of the ice sheets that used to be on North America, say 100,000 years ago or so, in this case, 21,000 years ago. And you can see a feature on the geologic map that matches this, right? So we see all these different colors that mean younger rocks, rocks that are younger than 500 million years. And then up in Canada, we see all this pink, right? And we can see that in the upper, you know, center to you know, northeast of Canada, there's all this pink. And it's because the glaciers scraped all the younger cover off of the rock. And now we have all these billion to multi-billion year old rocks exposed in, Can in Canada that were exposed by the glaciers. So we can see patterns of geologic process that are present at the, you know, continental map scale when we look at this. Now, Macrostrat doesn't just store the map context Right? It's not just looking at what's on the surface, but it also is looking at what's beneath the surface. So not only do we have the flat, you know, this is the rocks that are exposed at the surface in every given location. We also have an estimate or an idealized structure of what is the stack of rocks at any given location. So if you're going to drill a hole down in a given point on North America, all the way down to the oldest basement, right? What is that stack of rocks going to look like? And so this is something that Macrostrat also stores, right? Is the vertical stack of rocks. And so here we have an example column where you see these mosaic tiles covering North America. Each one of these is one unique stratigraphic column. And if you were to drill a hole there, ideally you would get something like this stack of rocks and this distribution of types of rocks. Not only do we have the names of the geologic units that have been there or that are, have been studied there, but we also have what they're made of, dolomite, siltstone, how thick they are, et cetera. And we have these stack of rocks. Now here, this, this stratigraphic column shows gaps, right? But all these rocks are actually sitting directly on top of each other. But the gaps are, are places where we recognize that there's times where rock was not deposited. So we have these vertical stacks of rocks. So in summary, right, the way Macrostrat works is we have individual observations that geologists and paleontologists have collected over the past couple centuries. And we've collected all this information into one place. And then geologists use this to make stratigraphy. We make these stratigraphic columns. These have been compiled within Macrostrat so that we have all of these columns. And essentially, it's as if you, you could take all of North America and lift it off of Earth's surface, and you could look at what is the distribution of the rocks underneath that surface, right? And we can do that not just on the edges of it, but we can see how that looks throughout the entirety of the continent as a 3D surface, right? And what we can do with that <clears throat> in terms of research is then we can make graphs of rock through time and how the amount of rock has changed and what types of rock have been dominant, right? And so what we're looking at on the right are some graphs that have been developed using Macrostrat data sets. So looking at, you know, that blue is all carbonates. That's limestone, marble, dolostone, right? And you can see that in the Paleozoic, in the, from the Cambrian to the Permian, so the CM to the P, uh, that is really dominated by those limestones. And then when we get into the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, the TR to the K, that that shifts. And we can see these shifts in patterns. So we can see a decrease in, you know, if we go from the CM to the P, the amount of rock decreases. Well, that's because the continents came together and formed Pangaea. So again, we can see patterns of geologic process in the rock record by looking at it from a new perspective and putting all this data together. And in terms of data equity, this data is all publicly available. So Macrostrat is an NSF funded project and it has an API in which you can access all of this data. Uh, and now, the API was built for my advisor to use it. <laughs> so
So it is a little bit difficult to learn, but if you do learn it, you can download the entirety of North America's geologic data set, which adds up to like, it is not that many megabytes. So it's really hard you know, sometimes I say big data, but technically what I'm doing is not big data because it fits within the memory of my personal computer. Uh, you know, so technically then that has changed through time as big data has, you know, our memory has gotten bigger and we have supercomputers, et cetera, et cetera. You are familiar with that, I'm sure. Uh, but MacroStrat operates on the principle that the central limit theorem, which essentially states that if we have a large enough data set and we know there's errors in it. We know that the stratigraphic data we have is not perfect. There will be errors in it. And we're not there to correct all those errors. But what we're assuming is that that error is randomly distributed. And so if we have enough data, the true macro scale trends will be preserved. And we've been able to confirm this by, if we go back and look at these patterns, these patterns match the things that geologists have been explaining as processes for a long time. Like for instance, we know that Pangea comes together and therefore decreases the amount of coastline and the amount of rock being preserved. And that is why we get a decrease in rock volume where Pangea comes together, right? So we can see patterns that confirm these things. And at least on the tens of millions of years to hundreds of millions of years scale, we can be, we're confident that the, the large scale macro scale patterns have been preserved. And we can also look at it in even bigger scale. So now this is going from zero modern day on the right, all the way to 2.5 billion years ago on the left. And this is the distribution of rock through time. And one of the expectations in the rock record is that as you go back through time, that what does erosion look like? The idea is that as you go back through time, it means that you should have less and less rock exponentially as you go back through geologic time. So more rock has been destroyed than has been preserved. And so if we go ahead and apply that, you know, erosional decay, the exponential decay, we get a curve that looks like this, but the rock record does not match that, right? And that was the expectation is as you go back through time, you get less and less rock generally matching an exponential decay. And as we, we see from MacroStrat, that is not the case. In fact, 500 million years ago, there is more rock on North America than there is rock from the last 10 million years, right? So there's been changes in the distribution and preservation of rock. And there's also this period of time that there's very little rock preserved. And I wanted to ask you at the audience, does anyone have a clue as to what this rock record feature is called, this gap where there's decreased rock volume over a period of about 1 billion years? Actually, I guess I'll, I'll, leave, this, I'll leave this open. And if you could read some of the things from the chat. <laughs> if there are any answers coming out. So far, no guesses from the chat. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Let's not know right. what this is called. Okay. Oh, not a clue, an ice age? <laughs> okay, so an ice age is good. Actually, in uh, that 720 million year range, there's snowball earth. Huh. So if you've ever heard of that. Uh, but anyway, this is what is known as the great unconformity, but maybe you've heard it better referred to as, or not better, more commonly referred to as, we don't like this term anymore in geology, the boring billion. Uh, and it's called the boring billion because there was not as much rock available. So there wasn't as much stuff, right, to actually measure. And so therefore it seemed like it was a period in which there was, a not, there was not a lot happening, right? And so this is a major feature of the rock record where you have Cambrian marine rocks and they sit directly on top of 1.5 billion year old much older metamorphic crystalline basement. And so this is a major feature of the rock record that we weren't able to quantify until we put all this data together and looked at it as the, you know, in these volumes. Now, if you remember, I talked about the Ediacaran and how I was super interested in the Ediacaran and the dawn of animals, and then the following Cambrian. Well, look where the Ediacaran sits. The Ediacaran sits in the border between this boring billion and the Cambrian explosion of life and the start of the Phanerozoic Eon, which is named because it means visible life. There's actually a, Darwin knew about the Cambrian in his time, though I don't think it was called the Cambrian, but it baffled him because it looked like life just suddenly appeared in the rock record. But now that we've filled in the gaps, we know that there's a much longer fuse. The origin of animals is somewhere here in the Ediacaran, and it serves this boundary between low preserved rock volume 
and high preserved rock volume. So, you know, as I've been working on MacroStrat, I've been more and more interested. And it looks, you know, as we, if we put in this red and this purple as igneous and metamorphic rocks, we throw that in and it looks like the great Anconformity might even be two parts, but this is ongoing research, something I'm gonna be working on in the future because I'm interested in that as well. But so far, this has all been very geo. This has all been very rock and geology focused, right? So this was the core of my PhD was working in the Ediacaran and compiling all this Ediacaran material so we could get this view of the Ediacaran. But I missed my fossils. I needed to get back to having fossils in my data set. Now, part of the problem with the Ediacaran is that animals first appear there. For all the rest of Earth history for 540 million years, the way we build geologic timescales is with fossils. We use fossils as anchor. We have anchor points of radioisotopic dates. So we have uranium lead dates. And then we use fossils to make those dates go farther, right? So we correlate them across the globe and we make geologic timescales based off of biostratigraphy. So we look at fossils, where they occur, how commonly they occur, how frequent they occur, what's their age range, et cetera. But the Ediacaran only has that in the upper 33%. And the fossils that are there, we don't understand them well enough to use them for biostratigraphy because we don't even know how they're related to Cambrian fossils, let alone modern fossils in terms of, or modern fossils, modern animals, uh, right, so to speak. So my PhD was really what if we compile a data set of Ediacaran rocks? So instead of taking the entire stack of rocks from the youngest cover to the oldest basement, what if I just cherry pick the Ediacaran and make my column areas and the stratigraphic thing, the stratigraphic context, just the Ediacaran. So we're being very Ediacaran focused. And so all this data was hand compiled from the literature. So I went through all the geologic literature and you'd be surprised, it's not as big as say astronomy or the medical field, right? But if you have 200 years or so of people collecting geologic data, it gets to be a pretty big data set. And the Ediacaran was only recently named. So it's gone by many different names throughout history that you have to look for. And because stratigraphy, you know, the stack of rocks and how it's developed, uh, there's many different reasons that people compile stratigraphy. And so there's not a standard way of reporting stratigraphy and there's different purposes and overlapping stratigraphy, et cetera. So I couldn't sick machine learning or an AI to go out and collect this data for me. So I had to go through a big data set and collect about 500 plus individual references of mesostrat level, this intermediate level of Ediacaran data across North America. And so what we're seeing here is on the left, is the data set I compiled. And on the right is the original MacroStrat, like all the columns, all right? And so all the columns in MacroStrat, they're those mosaic tiles. Because they span all of geologic time, there's not actually true geologic boundaries between the different tiles, right? They're just in, they're interpolated boundaries based off of basins. Whereas because I was Ediacaran centric, because I only cared about the Ediacaran and what was directly above and below it, all of the areas on the left map, the colored areas, are the areas where I found Ediacaran rock based on geologic maps. And those are true geologic boundaries. The, diff the separation between those columns are places where one rock transitions into another, or there was some sort of fault or fold that, that directly separated those rocks. All right, and so this is just a highlight difference. And I could make a whole other talk just based on the findings of what I had from the mesostrat data set of the Ediacaran. But again, I wanted to get back to the fossils, right? Because the fossils are where I'm interested in. And really, I compiled the Ediacaran rock data set so that I could learn more about the Ediacaran and figure out what is going on in this time period at the same time as animals appear. And so we need to learn a little bit of history about paleontology. And it's actually, people have been making compilations of how much rock there is and how many fossils there are and comparing the two uh, since the 1960s, right? So people have been doing this for a fair amount of time and they've consistently found that there are correlations between the amount of rock and the amount of fossils that you find. And in fact, this has resulted in two main hypotheses proposed as the explanations for this correlation. Either you have a rock bias where the rock record preservation drives fossil abundance, which means if you have more rock, you have more fossils and therefore more diversity. So you're not seeing true evolutionary trends. But there's also another hypothesis more recent called the common cause hypothesis is that rocks 
and fossils are controlled by a similar shared third mechanism. So sea level, for instance, is a strong control on both fossils or organisms that live in shallow marine environments and sea level and uh, where rocks get preserved. So the paleontologist nightmare is the fossil record biased by the rock record. So there's a preservation signal override so that we can't, we can't actually see true long-term patterns of evolution? Or is it possible that there's a common cause mechanism that means that they're both being shaped by the same thing and we're seeing true patterns of evolution in deep time over millions of years? And so, you know, this has been, you know, in the 60s, there was an initial push. In the 80s and early 90s, there was another set of researchers who compiled it with updated data, updated technology. And in the 2010s, my advisor, Shannon Peters, also used existing data sets uh, of fossils and rocks to put them together and re-examine these correlations. And they found some supporting evidence that it's a common cause mechanism. Right, that they're, the rocks and fossils are reacting to the same things through geologic time. And that we're actually, we can, at least on long-term trends, see true patterns of evolution. Now, what I wanted to do is that this, this data covered the last 540 million years. So notice that it stops there at the Cambrian, right? So it goes all the way up to the Cambrian and stops because at this time, the Ediacaran hadn't been quite as developed. In fact, it wasn't until the 1950s or 60s that paleontologists even believed that there were animal fossils in the Precambrian, that there were any uh, animal fossils before 540 million years ago. It actually wasn't until a 14-year-old girl named Tina Negus in the UK discovered a fossil that is unequivocally it's really hard to say, oh, yeah, no, that's just a gas escape structure or some abiotic process. And she found it in the Carnwood Forest of England in rocks that were there, they could be nothing but Precambrian. There was no way to argue that they were not Precambrian in age. And she discovered this, reported it to uh, you know, a local scientist or a, a, a professor who then published on it. And this is something that this is how we know, now know or the Ediacaran came to be added to the geologic time scale and is the dawn of animals. Now, again, I wanted to return to the fossil data, right? And so there's actually this lovely public data set known as the Paleobiology Database that has all of these really cool collections of fossils that is global, but it does have a, definitely a North American centric focus. Uh, and so I was able to link my macro, my Ediacaran mesostrat data set and Cambrian data sets of rocks to the paleobiology database because they shared geologic unit names as a field, right? So I was able to link them by the geologic units. And so this is some results from that. There's a lot of graphs and lines here, but really the big thing is, is that on the left, uh, the leftmost plot in panel A, this is the log number of occurrences in general, but this is counts of how many fossil occurrences in the paleobiology database are. And occurrences are just how many fossils are there. So you could have uh, the same species occurring over and over again at a certain site, and it would be reported as one occurrence each time, right? Whereas there's also the number of genera, which is the number of just one taxonomic level above species. And so it's a measure, a closer measure of diversity. So how many different types of fossils are there at a given location? And we can see that the number of occurrences in genera is pretty much the same. And if we look at panels C and D, this is really what I want you to pull from this, is that these are the amounts of C is rock area, and then D is rock volume. And that the patterns of the number of fossils is generally the same as the patterns of rock, the amount of rock. So in the Ediacaran, the dawn of animals, and the Cambrian, the patterns are still holding true, right? The rocks and fossils are correlated. And so we actually calculated what is the quantified amount of correlation between these curves. And there's a lot of correlations. And generally speaking, there are strong positive or negative correlations, depending on what it is. Turns out that the unit duration and thickness, so units tend to be able to be subdivided, so they're less thick and, le and have less time represented when you have fossils in them. So if you have fossils in the rock, they tend to be less thick because you can actually subdivide them more, right? And that's why there's a negative correlation there. But really the result we wanna highlight is that 
the number of occurrences has a strong positive correlation, and the number of genera has a strong positive correlation with the total rock area. But what's interesting is that the total number of genera, the metric for diversity, has a stronger correlation with the, so the one on the right, sorry, I'm pointing and I'm realizing that you're not seeing me point. <laughs> so the highlighted box on the right, uh, the red highlighted box on the right is the correlation, is the stronger correlation between total rock area and the diversity metric genera than with the total amount of occurrences. Now, if we thought that rock bias, right, was the predominant hypothesis, we would expect that we should have a stronger correlation with the number of occurrences and diversity, our, gener our genera, should also be correlated, but should have a lesser correlation because we're only getting more diversity because we have more occurrences. However, in this case, we see a stronger correlation with the diversity right? The diversity metric, right? So there's a lot of ways to measure diversity. So this is where we could definitely talk more about data equity <laughs> is the choices in what level of difference we're using. Uh, but the number of genera, our diversity metric, has the stronger correlation. And so that was a really interesting and finding that supports the idea that, well, actually, there's a strong environmental component and we can visualize this. So these, it's hard to publish things like this. So I had to publish this as supplementary information uh, because normally animations are not something you can include with the original publication. But what we're watching is there's time slices. So at the top, hopefully none of the Zoom controls are covering it for you. But at the top, it has 520 MA. That's how many millions of years ago this was. And each one is a snapshot where the colored tiles are the area that have marine rock that shallow marine organisms could live. And then the blue diamonds are everywhere we find a fossil occurrence. And we can see that in the Ediacaran, there's not that much rock, and there, but there are fossils that live with it. And then the Cambrian, we see this, this flooding right? The marine rock, the shallow marine settings are moving inland and the fossils are following it, right? So the reason that there's a diversity increase uh, with the increasing rock area is because, you know, there's an increasing amount of environments for those organisms to live in, right? There's the shallow marine environments are spreading across the continent and these organisms adapted to the shallow marine environments are tracking their perverted environment and expanding explosively uh, at you know at the time where the con when the continent floods and expands those habitats and so that was really our main finding from this where I've come back around and filled in you know and providing a new perspective on the Ediacaran and the Cambrian from this rock plus fossil uh, you know based view. And so this is a paper that was published four days ago <laughs> uh, that just came out. And so that is kind of the story I have of how you go from liking fossils, digging in around in your neighbor's uh, you know, rock pit all the way up to the point where we're looking at you know, the origin of animals and you know, the different things that are acting on earth to drive that. Okay. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. And what questions do you have? Wow. Thank you so much, Daniel. You folks can see why I was so excited to have Daniel as our special guest. Not only is your topic matter uh, really cool and different than a lot of the subject matter <laughs> that we spend our day to day in, but your, your storytelling and your graphics are amazing. Um, I have a lot of questions. Oh, excellent. <laughs> That's what wanna, I was hoping for. I don't want to take all the time. So um, this is the time uh, that if you are in the room and you have a question, uh, there's a couple of different ways you can ask it. You can put your question into the Zoom chat. You can either uh, use that drop down menu uh, set to everyone and then everybody will see your question. Or you can uh, just use my name, which is Heather Kraus set that blue drop down menu to Heather Kraus and you can direct message your question to me. Um, or if you're here and you wanna turn your mic on and ask a question uh, out loud to Daniel, uh, just raise your hand using uh, the Zoom controls uh, where you can say, raise your hand. Um, and if you don't know how to raise your hand, you can just unmute and that would be fine. Push the microphone button um, and go right ahead. So. 
great. Go ahead, uh, data team. I think I know your first name from from last time when you told us about that great uh, conference, by the way, but I forget it. <laughs> Hi. Hey, hi there. So this is a uh, shout out to Madison. This is City of Madison, Wisconsin's data team. Um, so my question is, uh, so first of all, really cool presentation. Thanks for sharing it. And my question is about what I, like when I saw the title of this talk, this is what I thought it was going to be about. And it was about something else, which is really cool. But I want to ask this as well. So a lot of these talks, and I think a lot of work around data and equity, there's some idea that your identity can influence how you kind of think about interpreting this data. And, and that there's, you know, certain things you might see or certain hypotheses you might choose to pursue based on your experiences, your background, your identity. I wonder, I'm very curious, and I wonder if you can talk about how that manifests in this field. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, there's, there's a saying um, for people who work in, so the period before the Cambrian is known as the Neo-Proterozoic. And there's a saying that is, there's a lot of ego in the Neo-Proterozoic uh, in that it can be hard to publish because there are people who have uh, hypotheses or ideas that they've held and published for a long time. <laughs> and it can be difficult to publish over that, but uh, because they are often be the reviewers because it's a smaller field of researchers, so on and so forth. Probably a story you have all heard or experienced before, right? But it is something where, yes, there's definitely parts of myself in this research. You know, even this research that is not uh, human centric, right, is there are absolutely parts of it in there. Uh, and one of the things that I've been very deliberate about approaching this research is that, you know, my motivations were I want to know. Like, personally, I want to know. And for me, sometimes writing is a secondary <laughs> objective. It's like, I really want to know myself, but it's something where I want to try and get at what is there, you know, in history, there's one way that this, that all of this happened. But with the geologic record, the information we're left with creates multiple possible solutions. And we may never actually constrain it down to one based on the data we have. However, the geologic record and paleontologic record are often much better than people expect they are, and we can learn from the gaps. Uh, but in terms of identity, you know, the I was very conscious about really trying hard not to have a pet theory going into developing the data. Is I really, I, I was very, because I have seen a lot of people who had, uh, in fact, my um, partner's advisor uh, was Often, this was often a very big thing for them is uh, that he would have a very specific idea and then there would be like data picking or massaging or he would encourage Brittany to change her data to fit that hypothesis. She's like, no, this isn't what the data say uh, or it doesn't support it, right? If we change the data to match it, then it's it's not, that is not uh, good science. Um, and so seeing those examples, I was very deliberate about really trying hard not to have a specific idea and really just building the data because, and I'm lucky in this way, right? That this data set, because it hadn't been built or viewed in this way before, it would be interesting no matter what, right? It was something where there wasn't, there wasn't, the only failure was that there wasn't enough data to put together in order to get meaningful results out of, right? And so it would be interesting no matter which way we looked at it. And so I really put it together without an expectation in my mind or tried really hard. That doesn't mean that it was always successful, right? But I really tried hard to put it together in a way that uh, I didn't have an expectation of what it would be. I didn't want to lean towards existing hypotheses or even be like, oh, I need to be a contrarian, right? But, and it was interesting because it provided new perspectives, right, of things we hadn't seen before, but it also fit and confirmed a lot of the things that the geologic record has been telling us that we've seen for a long time, even when we haven't quantified it in quite the same way. There's a lot of qualitative observations that we have that fit this, but that is definitely something where my identity goes into the, the research project, which is why I wanted to tell you the story of my motivations, right, for and how I came to be interested in paleontology and geology uh, and how that fit into, right, I, it's like I was really interested in the origins of animals and came along with that, and I didn't really have a favorite hypothesis. I didn't really have a, a one that I liked. I just want to know what actually happened, and so that's how I approach the research is 
how, how can we best figure out or narrow it down as much as possible, knowing that we'll never quite get all the way there because we can't go back in time and snorkel on an Ediac and Reef, which I would love to do. Uh, but yeah, so I know that was a long-winded answer and kind of rambling, but hopefully I got to what you were asking there. And also glad to see a data science team from Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely did. That was a fabulous answer. And um can I follow up with one more kind of related question to take that answer a little bit further? Because I think uh, that was kind of the question that many people direct messaged me in slightly different ways. And one of the things is um, that a big part of data equity is who you tar who your target audience is uh, when you go to communicate about your data. That's kind of related to um, what you were saying about uh, making sure you document how and why you make the choices. Um, you are a fantastic, very plain spoken speaker. <laughs> do you personally oh, or you. do does your institution have thoughts about how you bring this story contextualized from a data equity perspective, which I think is very unique um, for people who who can't like, resonate with a published paper who do you think yeah. is going to benefit from this most most who, who would benefit most from the information yes and so if when i'm writing grants the way i sell this information yeah. is uh or the way i make a connection is that this is this is the time period where if we're looking for life on other worlds right? This is a period of time where this is where animals develop. This is where multicellular metazoans, things that are bags within bags, so they have organs and an out external covering over those organs, which are the organs themselves are clusters of cells, right? And all that stuff. So this is where multicellular animals, as we recognize them, show up. And so what is going on on earth that helps that as a, as a thing to like, what do we look for? on other planets. So exoplanets have been exploding recently in terms of like, we are getting so much better at identifying exoplanets. And now we're starting to look at their spectral spectral signatures and look at their atmospheres, right? So what, what kind of things should we look for in that way? So in that way, the search for life, which a lot of people are very interested in, could be a connection. The other thing is that I think a lot of the work I do, the way I think about it is a lot of the work I do has a few lines in an earth science textbook. Right? There might be a few lines dedicated to the Cambrian in an earth science textbook for middle school. And I'm really interested in getting the big picture things, uh, you know, it further investigating those really big picture, broad perspective views so that I might change those sentences to be more accurate or we think is more accurate representing earth history. So that, you know, because the Cambrian explosion uh, I think many of you may have heard about before, right? But it's something where actually we think that's a bad term in geology because geologic it is geologically rapid, but it's mm. it's evolution that still occurs over 5, 10, 15, 20 million years. So much time that it is, I, I study geology and I still can't wrap my head around how much time that actually represents. That's a lot of generations of critters <laughs> doing their thing. Um, and, you know, and just... Just being able to put into perspective, and like I said at the start, right, this is our shared history. This is the history I'll share. It's like we're, I don't know that we necessarily like to think about ourselves in this way, but we started as animals and, you know, our our origins uh, on earth, this, our, our one home, right, is in animals. And so I love to, to look at the history of earth and to share that with people, which is why I like to do outreach with, uh, say, I've given presentations on paleontology to sixth grade classrooms, and I'll show them the animation I showed you, the flooding of the continent and how the fossils track it, right, sort of thing. And that this is research I do and showing them that it's not just dinosaurs <laughs> that gets right. all the attention, right, because dinosaurs are great. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I love no. dinosaurs, <laughs> of course. but it's, it's the big focus, right? In paleontology, it gets all the news attention typically, right? Yes. right? So I love, I love being able to expand uh, the earth science, you know, mm -hmm. perspective for people to, to be beyond like, well, there's actually a lot more of earth history than dinosaurs. Well, you're very, very, very talented at it. You're an amazing storyteller. And I think we have time only for one more question. I, I know that there's a few more questions we're not going to get to, but a lot of people have asked um, publicly and privately, um, 
not everybody who studies like the hard sciences, if we're going to use that word, uh, is interested to have a conversation about something like data equity and think about data and the influence of a human scientist on the way that data like this is collected and interpreted. Do you have any suggestions or tips for how you might talk to other quote unquote, hard scientists about why data equity matters. What got you initially interested? And like, do you have call conversations with your colleagues about this? Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. And it's, it's something where I think, I don't know that if I have tips for convincing someone, especially if you have somebody who's uh, very established in their field and is, is very much like, this is the way it is. This is the way I've done it. This is the way I've always done it. it it's very yeah. hard to get to those people, but I yeah. think that the, I, what I could say is that, or what I've thought about, okay, well, let me start with, I got interested in this because of my connection with ESIP, Earth Science Information Partners. And actually that was how I connected with you in that workshop right. was Megan Carter sent out an email saying, hey, you guys should check this out. It might be interesting. And it's like, I've never thought about my data in that way before. Right. Uh, and I've thought about it from a perspective of data integrity of making sure that I am being as transparent as possible, not hiding things, not massaging data to get specific outcomes, uh, you know, and not, you know, doing all that. But that was more of a, I never had a class that taught data ethics, which is, I think, a travesty that, yes. you know, people who work with data science should have a data ethics class. Um, and I think, I think that's where the real change happens. It's not convincing the people who are already kind of set their ways, mm -hmm. not that we shouldn't try. But, you know, in maybe hoping to, you know, establishing better procedures and practices for our future generations of data science, and data scientists, and really talking about how it's like, if you massage the data, let's say you have a paleo climate data set, and you massage the data to get a specific outcome, that's going to change the outcome of predictive models that use your data, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, that affects everyone, right, right, so to speak. And it's like my data, maybe not so much. It changes how we view earth history and that can be important to some people, but yeah. it's something where, I don't know, it, we definitely have a, we have a responsibility uh, to the ethics of, you know, how we're collecting the data and how we're reporting it and not just doing it to get the most attention or other things, but, I, but I've always done it because I'm interested in it. So I have that luxury. That's another thing is that <laughs> I, I've I've been very lucky and privileged in that I've been able to pursue this. And it's just something that I love in that way. Yeah. Well, thank you for the tips. I think that that is a very good point. And I think that your examples that you shared with us uh, will equip us to have different types of conversations with people who, who might be interested, uh, who who might be open to the idea that uh, everything, even if it's a rock, is not entirely value neutral, <laughs> at least yes. our interpretation of it. <laughs> and I, uh, I put my email in the chat. So if anyone has further questions or follow-ups that you'd like to, to ask, I am more than happy to answer. I love talking about this. So, All right. Well, I think you will get some because we did not get to even half of the questions that are in the <laughs> chat. There are lots and lots of questions. So oh, um, that's very generous of you. I hope you don't spend uh, too much of your time off uh, answering our questions, but it's very generous of you. And um, we're going to have to leave it there. It's the top of the hour. Um, Daniel, the uh, stories that you told, the visuals that you brought, the insights that you shared were incredibly valuable. We're all going to be thinking about it for a long time to come. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And everybody who came, thank you also for joining us uh, for another Talking Dead Equity. It would, of course, be nothing without you folks in the community. So I really appreciate it. It means so much to us that you want to spend time with us on Fridays. And we'll put the video up as soon as possible, along with some links. And we are back next Friday for our final Talking Data Equity of 2023. Um, same time, noon Eastern time. Uh, and the link is always the same. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Daniel, and take care, everybody else. Yes. Thank you so much.